Urban Works Agency is a nonprofit research organization within CCA focusing on the intersection between urbanism, technology, and the environment. Uh, we'd like to thank everyone for coming today, um, including our guests, uh, Pierre Vittorio Aureli and Emilia Bruso, um, and their students from Yale, who were uh, kind of the catalyst for today's event. Um, uh, these are some of the initiatives, um, conferences, uh, publications, uh, studios, etc. we've been involved in um, uh, as the Urban Works Agency, and I encourage you to go onto our website, urbanworks.cca.edu, to find out more. Um, and really, they're about projects that are involved uh, over the last few years with um, global public and private partners, including design research, conferences, symposia, etc. Um, but today, we wanted to bring together a diverse group of architects, planners, uh, developers, housing advocates, uh, and entrepreneurs to discuss a pressing issue, both in San Francisco, but also globally, um, inequality. So, um, so far in CCA, in the last couple of years, we've been taking on a long-term project that we're calling Domestic Affairs. This is our first uh, symposium, or a series of symposiums we're going to be holding over the next couple of years. And essentially, we're trying to look at uh, the issue of inequality and new forms of density in San Francisco. Uh, we're interested in taking our students outside of the institution and embedding them in collaborative context uh, with uh, surrounding uh, collaborators such as San Francisco Planning. Uh, but today we reverse this trend. We're actually bringing all of you guys to CCA to take a moment to just step back and reflect uh, as a larger group of what we're doing in the city. So this is, a, this is an image just outside CCA. You guys probably entered there. And just around the corner we see this issue uh, just in our own neighborhood and in lots of places in San Francisco. Um, so what is inequality? Uh, inequality <coughs> is the measurable socioeconomic gap between the wealthy and the impoverished and it has become the defining uh, feature of the 21st century city. A 2014 study prepared by the economic consulting company IHS Global Insight uh, declared that despite a growing number of jobs on America, the income divide uh, was growing. More recently, a report by Oxfam concluded that the richest 62 individuals in the world have the same wealth as the poorest 3.5 billion people. Uh, perhaps most troubling is the conclusion of the IHS report, which estimated that the inequality will grow in the United States. And quote, income inequality is a structural feature of the 21st century economy. As a structural feature, the severity of our present day inequality calls into question the distribution of power and the health of our current democracy. The battleground between the haves and have nots is being played out in cities where these tensions are most apparent and over housing a key indicator of wealth distribution. San Francisco, which boasts similar levels of inequality to Madagascar, is at the center of this debate. With highest rental prices in the country, San Francisco is emblematic of the growing tensions over space. If housing and ownership of space are the core of defining inequality, could architecture and form be more central in addressing the widening gap between the rich and the poor? Um, so, over the past few years, we've been working with San Francisco Planning Department and SPUR and have undertaken two collaborations um, examining different forms of density. Uh, the first, um, Urbanism for the, from Within, uh, took on a more tactical and diffused approach. And the second, Horizontalism, which is uh, underway right now, utilized a series of more consolidated sites in the city. Um, what both projects share is a commitment to new forms of density. And if we think of density, um, most people's image is uh, something like this, you know, high rises downtown. Um, but even if we agree that adding density to urbanized areas is a sustainable thing to do, our image of this kind of density is typified by this kind of high rise residential uh, massing in the downtown developed by free market developers. Our provocation in these projects has been that there's other more subversive ways to add density to the city that do not require the long timelines and massive capital investments that these towers require. And just as importantly, may avoid the negative anti-development backlash that these projects often provoke. So uh, with that, I'm just going to present the first phase of research that we did last year um, in collaboration with San Francisco Planning Spur, as well as Open Scope Studios of Ian Don is here and, and Mark Hogan here in the city. Uh, this is a, a project that emerged 
really from looking at some of these critical numbers that underline the housing crisis. And while the lack of housing and exploding population are well documented, uh, a large percentage of homeowners and rent controlled units on the market reveal that there is a small percentage of people in San Francisco with a vested interest in the housing crisis. If we look at the cost of building a new single uh, unit of housing in San Francisco, including the all-in cost of land acquisition, permitting, construction, etc., you see that for a modest 800 square foot unit, the total cost is approaching half a million dollars. So that's just cost, that's not you know, recouping any uh, money for a developer. So this uh, project looked at a more diffused form of density in the form of secondary units such as attics, uh, garage apartments, etc., as a means of distributing the increased population with a quicker timeline of construction and of lower costs. Uh, if you do a quick search online, you'll see uh, current prices for a one-bedroom apartment is around 3,500, and these secondary units come in considerably less. Uh, you know, there's an estimate that there's about 50,000 of these units currently uh, out there in San Francisco, and several of these are illegal. And, and by the way, for our out-of-town guests, 1,600 is very cheap for an uh, apartment here. Um, so one of the benefits of the secondary unit is that they leave the image of the city intact. And this is an image that is really fought over and is known worldwide and linked to the city's magnetic pull for tourists. And, and this persistence of the city's image positions design as the critical mechanism to rethink forms of domestic space, forms of sharing, and essentially how space beyond the facade can be reparsed. So this, in this image, you see you know, the, the image of the city on the bottom and how the you know, cross-section of the city is completely parsed up into a, a very different uh, version of living. So this was a, a result of a research seminar, and as I stated, we worked with OpenScope Studio, who was looking a bit more at uh, cost, planning codes, and so forth. Um, and we isolated together with OpenScope a series of typologies um, to investigate in San Francisco. We initiated the investigation by zooming out and focusing on the geometries of the typical block, its parcelization, uh, its zoning envelope, and topography as preconditions for the development of these typologies. And as we zoomed into an actual block, uh, we were really trying to unpack the relationship, uh, among other things, light and views, access, parking, and the massing of each type. These preconditions set up a formula that each typology follows to integrate interior spaces, circulation, and light and air that dictate the final form of any given house in San Francisco. In this fashion, a typological study provides clues for how adding density in secondary units can have a larger impact across the entire city. So for example, here uh, we we're looking at the end block condition, and due to a, a typical parcelization such as this that leaves this big unit on the end block, and you see this often in San Francisco, you get multi-unit housing on these corner lots. So addressing this as a typology, in fact, addresses almost every corner of, of San Francisco. In this type here, an end lot has a, a side court, uh, an unpermitted uh, freestanding garage in the rear of the lot. And this, is, this condition is enabled by the main unit. Uh, it's giving access to the light along the side of the building rather than the rear yard. And so again, by addressing uh, this garage, you are really addressing hundreds of garages like that that sit in similar block conditions. So our research methodology continued by examining the deep structure of each type. So for instance, if we were to unpack the typical Victorian house as it stands today, we can see how it has already gone, undergone several transformations from its original inception. So this house, for instance, a typical Victorian you'll see uh, you know, in the Mission District, was once a single family house. At some point it was divided into two apartments, initiating a small series of interventions to provide uh, second entrances and redundancy of services. And if we continue this evolution forward, we can see the addition of a secondary unit uh, in general has to embed itself within the similar rule sets that govern this typology. So this, this in, in general, was our methodology of going from uh, how blocks are parcelized how that parcelization structure sets up ways of defining circulation within the interior of the unit, and how access to light then defines the arrangements of rooms, uh, and of course, the intended and modified use uh, to this day. So I'm just going to show a couple examples. This project here uh, by Jared Clifton uses an upslope lot in the Castro, uh, which these upslope lots typically generate very tall ground floors. 
uh, which becomes an opportunity for two units to be installed that take advantage of the tall ceiling height. Uh, targeted towards a population that will age in place, these two units extend the light well of the building deep into uh, the garage space and allows it to separate two family members' units. Uh, in this case, an unconventional attic space takes a long, uh, narrow space with low ceiling heights on the edges and converts them into a thickened wall that is lined with storage furniture and essentially the domestic machinery to allow for a very flexible and open-ended um, central space. And in here, uh, this is a typical multi-unit building uh, in the mission that has uh, an addition on the back that was put in at some point for a secondary exit. And instead, this typology actually looks at building a proper exit strategy and using this vertical space to rethink of a more vertical unit that uses the stair and a series of platforms to organize the programs in the house. So we've summarized each of these research types into a, uh, a newspaper that can be assembled into a catalog. And the intent of this catalog was really to communicate this research to a larger audience and make it accessible to help expand awareness and promote the programs uh, that San Francisco Planning has been undertaking. Uh, this eventually became an exhibition at Spur, and the, the goal of the exhibition was really to design the kind of intimacy that allows one to peer into these private spaces that one typically doesn't have access to, and revealing a series of interior worlds. Um, and this exhibition was designed around the display of the research, but also occupied the gallery space with a series of interior rooms, hiding the models uh, between these fabric wrappers. So just to conclude, uh, in aggregate, the secondary unit and their diffuse form of density provide a unique opportunity to test a bottom-up strategy to addressing the housing crisis, which most closely aligns itself with the discourse in tactical urbanism. And we really see the study as a first phase in a longer discussion of how to mediate these tactics with longer-term strategies for a renewed discourse on strategic urbanism. Um, not only are new modes of speculation required to understand the aggregated effects of these units on the city, a strategic framework is required to situate these units in the city. Um, this meaning that this is a very different paradigm for planning where San Francisco planning it makes it very difficult to track the amount of density and therefore the response of the city uh, in terms of larger services, bus lines, park space, and so forth. So uh, I think from there I'm going to kind of give it to Chris and Antia who took a, a more top-down approach in their studio last fall. Just to introduce my colleague, Antje Steinmuller, who is an um, uh, assistant professor uh, here of architecture here at CCA, and a, um, a uh, collaborator with us in the Urban Works Agency. And Antje and I ran a studio um, this past uh, fall called Horizontalism, um, which we're going to show briefly an overview here. Um, you know, we're living in a time when there's an alarming degree of inequality in our country and, and globally, and um, one of my favorite uh, political philosophers, um, Umberto uh, Unger, Roberto Umberto Unger, um, uh, um, talks about uh, the creation of a kind of high energy democracy to um, address this kind of equality in a very experimental forms um, that can um, that can create new uh, institutions and new social relations. And, and we really feel like in San Francisco, um, as we're experiencing the housing crisis is a very tangible result of that um, inequality and that increasing divide what, between those who can and cannot afford to live here. We also must experiment um, with many different ways of accommodating density and, and providing housing uh, that is affordable to all income levels. Um, not only to our current citizens, but also to hundreds and thousands of new residents that we're expecting to arrive uh, over the next uh, half century. Um, most of you are familiar with the statistics of the San Francisco housing crisis. Um, what's important is that this is a crisis that San Francisco can no longer afford to muddle through. Um, and short of a massive influx of public money, most see a dramatic increase in supply as uh, one of the only workable solutions to meet demand and make housing more affordable. 
In early 2014, Ted Egan, the city's chief economist, estimated that it would be necessary to build 100,000 units of housing to begin to have a stabilizing effect on median rents. Um, this is equal to the amount of units that have been constructed in San Francisco since 1920, so a staggering amount, for sure. Um, and while it's likely that supply alone will not solve San Francisco's affordability crisis, and we really have a regional uh, jobs and housing uh, crisis, um, but it, the production of space for housing must be a key component of any solution that is within the purview of architects and planners, certainly. Um, regardless of whether this solution is spatial, economic, or political, it can no longer continue, in our opinion, as an incremental site-by-site -site approach, but must happen at the scale of the city. But we are mostly terrified of density because of the image that it has that kind of threatens this image of the city that Naraj discussed as a um, historically you know, low-density fabric of Victorians. And you know, the most recent paradigm that most people see day-to-day -day has been this kind of construction of, of high and mid-rise um, housing uh, blocks downtown, south of Market, and recently in the Mission. Since the 60s, though, this kind of the threat of Manhattanization has been the cause of a lot of debate and a lot of um, political discourse. And uh, many people see it as a threat, destroying what uh, is the specific qualities of San Francisco. So if the form of Manhattanization is basically not politically palatable, what other forms really become available was sort of the topic of our studio. and. Um, in essence, we were arguing that innovative solutions to the housing crisis are really a spatial problem that must be approached at the urban scale. And we use the adding of the 100,000 units um, really as an alibi for experimenting with a different form of density and one that can really construct a new vision for San Francisco and that accepts the rejection of Manhattanization as a premise and looks uh, specifically towards horizontal forms. Um, we also, in our premise, um, accepted the reality that we rely on a developer-driven, market-based growth model, and um, yet that in San Francisco it is um, politically not acceptable to tear down existing housing. So those were kind of the frameworks that um, we took. So we collaborated with Kristen Dishinger um, from the San Francisco Planning Department uh, in their current, effort, current efforts to develop the um, Affordable Housing Density Bonus Program as a tool to meet housing goals. The Affordable Housing Bonus Program allows developers to expand the current height limit by two to three stories based on a provision of a specific ratio of affordable middle income and market rate housing. So the studio really looked at the potentials behind this program to open up what we call sort of new parcels in the sky, a new unbuilt city floating above the existing one. We focus specifically on seven landlocked parcels um, that are in essence the neighborhood commercial and residential mixed use areas that the affordable housing bonus program applies to. And um, these are typically uh, sites of the city uh, where we don't really expect a lot of density to happen. Um, so what you see here and marked in black um, are the areas we focused on. What's marked in blue is uh, the areas that the Affordable Housing Bonus Program applies to. So we, in essence, looked at the neighborhoods of uh, Van Ness, Divisadero, Fillmore, uh, Geary Clement, Taraval, the Outer Mission, and Third Street. So for the purpose of the studio, we began looking at each of these neighborhoods as specific urban typologies with characteristic planimetric and sectional qualities. And these formal characteristics were important for us for anticipating how new civic figures can be designed within the city as horizontal density develops in these neighborhoods. So assuming that the additional two stories available through the density bonus program in these neighborhoods the studio site was the unbuilt city above these neighborhoods, the city of unexploited zoning, transfer of development rights, and uh, hybrid public-private development solutions. However, we also wanted to challenge some of the assumptions behind the program and push it to more experimental extremes. For instance, like most zoning, the affordable housing development density bonus program assumes a somewhat two-dimensional city in that it generally ignores topography and its relation 
uh, to our overall urban form when blanketing districts with additional, additional stories of density. So our studio speculated on more provocative ways of implementing these policies as collective urban scale formal projects that focus specifically on the tension between the grid, the topography, um, as places of opportunity for public benefit. So for each neighborhood, um, we utilized a kind of standard set of drawing conventions and techniques to analyze existing urban form in relation to these spatial typologies and to extract specific conditions and begin to identify areas of opportunity. And this is one area you um, forgot to mention in the list, but this is Lombard uh, along with Chestnut and, um, and uh, Union Street, which kind of forms a triple corridor. Um, these drawings focus specifically uh, on the three-dimensional form of the built fabric as well as topography to prioritize a reading of the city as a formal condition on which both formal, to, you know, uh, they can be operated on with formal tools and techniques. We then zoomed in on a series of focus areas within these neighborhoods um, and took a closer look at the existing unutilized capacity of air rights based on existing zoning as well as the additional zoning capacity that the program would add. And this drawing, it's a little bit difficult to see here, um, starts with the, the form of the city um, on the bottom as that kind of rectangle. Um, and then floating above it is basically the unused air rights up to the, to the current zoning limit um, as a kind of jello mold uh, of that existing city. Then on top of that is the additional two stories that the program uh, would allow within its area. And then we've kind of flipped it uh, upside down so you can look at that space below and you, you see a kind of uncanny uh, resemblance to uh, the form of the city below. Uh, and we really took this as a, a kind of three-dimensional site uh, that could be occupied and inhabited by a new series of architectural types. And as our goal was to develop new urban collective forms in dialogue with the topography, we introduced case studies from around the globe that have their own version of multiple public levels in dialogue with topographic conditions. Um, so one of the examples was the city of Edinburgh with its sort of split uh, uh, street levels and three-dimensional intersections. Or Hong Kong's elevated pedestrian network or Vienna's rooftop additions incentive that in essence produced a whole new um, datum floating above the city for new development above. And um, these case studies were analyzed basically for strategies that could, what that could um, produce what we refer to as zoning hacks. So um, we basically extracted potentials for intensifying the envelope of the unbuilt city in innovative ways um, that allow for larger collective forms to be developed in relationship to San Francisco's unique topography. These hacks were then reapplied back to the uh, study areas within the neighborhoods um, and developed into urban scale projects that synthesize uh, non-hierarchical forms of public infrastructure, uh, topographic manipulations, and multiplied ground levels and new forms of horizontally intense density. Um, heavy emphasis was placed on the formal investigation of urban scale architecture um, that challenges the kind of incrementalism of block by block and fill and construct um, new spatial typologies uh, above existing uh, built fabric. Um, then strategically these projects are broken down into a series of phases uh, that leverage the interplay between public investment and private development to catalyze the construction of a kind of urban mega project within an accelerated timeline. Um, embracing the linkage between housing production and infrastructural investment, the projects are often initiated by the expansion or implementation of current or proposed transportation and utility infrastructures, such as uh, bus rapid transit lines, uh, replacement of uh, utilities, um, undergrounding of um, streets, etc. Um, and then Leveraging the unbuilt city as a new resource um, while working within the, the kind of market-based system led the studio to two specific spatial challenges. One is to how to connect these new parcels in the sky um, above existing built fabric um, you know, to the city below. And secondly, how to produce new types of collective urban form as these new sites become connected with topography into new uh, public levels in the city. Uh, in response to the first challenge, 
And in order to access the new real estate created in the sky and catalyze a collective project, a series of soft sites are identified where private development can be incentivized to build the initial phases of housing and neighborhood amenities while avoiding the politically untenable destruction of existing housing stock or displacement of current residents. Anticipating the evolution of new public typologies in the sky, these private developments are heavily regulated in both form and program to pr include public access and structural systems that anticipate the la later development of collective forms, creating lateral connections and horizontal volumes uh, that um, occupy the unutilized air rights and deliver delivered through a kind of public-private partnerships and other hybrids between the market and civic investment. These sort of horizontal collective forms um, become the manifestation of a kind of imagined reorganization of property that, that reformats the fragmented and privatized ground plane of the city and aggregates it into a vast new public resource that can be leveraged to incentivize market-driven development and channel it toward the production of a new civic space that not only addresses the current housing crisis, but produces a new social contract, a kind of grand bargain between the city and capital. So in closing, the studio must be understood as a counterproposal to the misperception that urbanism is a zero-sum game. Our political position and our rallying cry um, has thus become more is more. That new development of market-rate housing does not take away an equivalent amount of affordable housing if new land can be created through creative use of zoning and parcelization strategies. Likewise, the production of new levels of civic space does not take away from the existing life of the street, but adds to its new potentially adds to it new potentially novel forms of publicness. Yeah. Um, so I think now we'll introduce uh, our other presenters. You know, Eric Rogers has been organizing this symposium today with us, and uh, Eric, I know you had an introduction as well. Do you want to? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have any slides, but I just briefly introduce him in, him in urbanism, so that's all right. Hi, I'm Eric Rogers. Um, I'm an architectural theorist and historian, um, also a designer, and, um, and I live in communes, and um, I also work on a few projects related to how everyday people are remaking uh, the urban environment, uh, despite architects' efforts um, to sort of shape their behaviors, and, and um, we have been organizing this uh, lecture series, which has just started, um, called Imminent Urbanisms, and it's just about this idea that um, everyday people are shaping the built environment uh, to their own specifications and according to their own needs. Um, we have a lot of really great speakers, a lot of really great panels. Um, some of the topics that are being covered are things like um, street art and graffiti and, and skateboarding and how like these sort of creative practices sort of remake the city or misuse the city, like they use the city in ways that wasn't designed to be used. Um, the ways in which people are living in public spaces. We have um, a lot of folks who we call homeless here in San Francisco who have very much made a home out of the built environment, so we're investigating this. Uh, we're looking at the creation of queer spaces, places where basically hetero-urbanism has been turned into like these these areas where um, high densities of queer uh, LGBTQ uh, people live, um, and and they're remaking of those spaces to fit um, lifestyles that may be different from those that um, the spaces were designed for. Uh, we are also looking at um, the idea of temporary autonomous zones. So this idea that um, some type of culture can flourish for a moment in an urban environment and then dissipate just as quickly. Um, so. Yeah, and we have a bunch of um, really great speakers. Anyway, today's panel is going to um, involve people who are working on communal housing projects. So folks who have designed and created uh, communes in urban environments, uh, despite the fact that the architecture wasn't necessarily in their favor in those cases. So the ways in which basically non-architects and non-designers have, um, have grappled with the existing built environment and injected new sort of social structures within that environment. Uh, so yeah, that's basically what we're going to be talking about today. Fantastic. Um, so just to, to start us off, we're going to, first panel is called uh, The Right to the City, and I'm just going to describe a little bit about uh, what we mean by that. Um, the disenfranchisement of citizens from the larger neoliberal engines of globalization that affect their daily inhabitation threatens what the Fabra has referred to as the right to the city. 
For Lefebvre, the right to the city proposes that power relations, primarily through capital, that govern the production of urban space need to be restructured to orient control to the urban inhabitant through participation and appropriation to eradicate unjust inequality. Building on Lefebvre, David Harvey has posited the following, and I'm going to quote in some length here. The, the question of what kind of city we want cannot be divorced from what kind of social ties, relationship to nature, lifestyles, technologies, and aesthetic values we desire. The right to the city is far more than the individual liberty to access urban resources. It is a right to change ourselves by changing the city. It is, moreover, a common rather than an individual right, since this transformation inevitably um, depends upon the exercise of collective power to reshape the processes of urbanization. Harvey goes on to argue that the freedom of collective agency over the city, which is linked to our ability to change itself, is the most precious human right. The ability to change the city requires one to envision alternate futures, and we're hoping that today's conversation will bring together a group of people and a range of perspectives uh, to help us uh, envision where the future of San Francisco can go. So I'll um, briefly introduce our uh, first panel of speakers, and then um, I think we'll have them go in the order um, that I'm introducing them, um, which is alphabetical, lack of a better organization system. Um, <laughs> Adams, Daniel Adams is Director of Real Estate Development at Bridge Housing, where he leads the organization's efforts to transform a 38-acre, severely dilapidated public housing site in the Potrero Hill neighborhood of San Francisco into a thriving mixed-income community. A licensed architect, Dan has over 20 years of experience in community development, having previously served as a Director of Development at Midpen Housing, Director of Program Development at the San Francisco Mayor's Office of Housing, and a Project Manager at Resources for Community Development in Berkeley. Dan's work at the City of San Francisco included serving as a staff lead for the passage of Prop C, a $1.5 billion trust fund to support the creation and preservation of affordable housing. So we do, from time to time, get a little bit of funding from the welfare state. <laughs> <One more time. laughs> uh, a recipient of the prestigious Enterprise Rose Architectural Fellowship, Dan holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Texas and master's of architecture degree from UC Berkeley. David Baker, FAIA, founded San Francisco-based David Baker Architects in 1982, a progressive leader in the field of sustainable, affordable housing. The firm has come to be known for combining social concern with a signature design character. David has been honored as the Nonprofit Housing Association Design Visionary and as the AIA California Council's 2012 Distinguished Practice. In 2010, he received the Hearthstone Builder Humanitarian Award honoring him as one of the housing industry's 30 most influential people in the last 30 years. His recent projects include 388 Fulton Street, San Francisco's first market rate micro units to hit the market, and Storefront Lab, a gallery space that explores the storefront as a place of community, creativity, and local industry. She also mentioned he has a fantastic project uh, about to come online just at our own back door here. Um, you should learn more about David's work at www.dbarchitect.com. Kirsten Dishinger leads the planning department's housing policy work for the city of San Francisco and has over 10 years of long-range planning and policy experience. Her work covers housing policy, transit-oriented development, infrastructure planning, value recapture, and transportation network planning. Kirsten has managed citywide and neighborhood-based planning projects, including the Affordable Housing Bonus Program, the ADU Handbook, the city's housing element, the market in Octavia area plan, and the green connections plan. She likely learned that most, the most about planning from her childhood days in suburban Philadelphia. Oh my God. <laughs> um, uh, however, she also studied at the University of Chicago and Cornell University. Uh, Kirsten has also partnered with CCA's Urban Works Agency, as we mentioned, on these two courses uh, that have brought CCA's design work to San Francisco's ongoing housing policy conversations. Last but not least is Sonia Trous, the leader of the San Francisco Bay Area Renters Federation. After living in Philadelphia and St. Louis, where housing supply is not an issue, Sonia was surprised and distressed to discover the political pessimism around solving the Bay Area's housing crisis. Drawing on, on her experience working for her neighborhood association in Philadelphia, in May 2014, Sonia began organizing renters to speak in favor of any and all large projects seeking approval before the Planning Commission in San Francisco. 
SFBARF is the increased capacity arm of the anti-displacement organizing in San Francisco and Oakland. So welcome to all of you, and uh, we'll start with Dan. Great. Oh yeah, sorry, we have yeah. and just not uh, to forget. Just, just don't forget, <laughs> yeah. uh, we have a lot of things going on today, but the main event uh, is uh, a series of lectures by Pierre Vittorio Rally and Reinhold Martin, um, which will start at seven o'clock tonight. So. All right. Now we'll start. With now we'll start. Great. Well, I'm very happy to be here. Um, excited for this topic and uh, the conversation we can have. I'll keep my comments brief. Um, so we can have plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, I'm going to present on a project that I'm working on uh, just on the other side of this hill that sits behind us here, Chero Hill. Um, and it's a rebuilding of a public housing site. But I, I want to frame the presentation uh, in the context of uh, a set of policies that are really at the cornerstone of a lot of San Francisco's affordable housing policies, and that's uh, value recapture, or capturing a portion of the value that is derived through investment uh, in development and, and directing that value towards social ends. And so I want to frame it in this way as a way of calling into question the presumptive association between density and equity. In other words, uh, unless we're grappling with this notion of value creation, the, the connection between density and addressing inequality is really a tenuous one. We recognize that a lot of the most dense places in this country and around the world are actually our most unequal places. We really struggle with Madagascar-like forms of inequality. So, as I'm talking about this project and as our, as our conversation unfolds, I hope we think about what is the value that is created? To whom does that value accrue? And over what period of time? And so what kind of policy frameworks do we need to have in place as we move toward densification? Density is good. Good design is good. More is more, but it's not enough. At least I, I would say it's not enough. So with that, so, um, as was described, I'm working on this project uh, uh, in, in Petrero Hill neighborhood. It's the San Francisco Public Housing in Petrero. It's 38 acres. There are 606 units there now. You can see in this aerial, a classic post-war barrack style public housing. A lot of us are familiar with these kinds of images. Uh, it is not unique to Petrero Hill uh, at all. You go to the next slide. Here are some examples of uh, the current uh, building types and uh, fabric, if you could call it that. Um, what is, I think, uh, particularly notable uh, in this in these set of images is the amount of space that's there. There's there's land in there in them hills, um, and so when we talk about value and space, especially in a spatially constra constrained place like San Francisco. That, that land, those, open, those, those poorly defined open spaces, then become opportunities to create value. It's, it's in some ways like creating land, uh, creating space it's in the previous studio, that this, this program intends to exploit uh, to the advantage of, of the residents. Petrero Hill is an interesting neighborhood in that it re represents the kind of extremes of uh, uh, income that were described in the introduction. The north side of the hill, the one that sort of comes down to CCA, is a very wealthy neighborhood, um, low poverty, weight, uh, poverty rate, uh, good retail amenities, high school graduation rates are high, and it really is connected to the, to the larger fabric of the city through its more traditional street grid. Street grid. While the south side, where Petro, uh, the public housing is, you have a very low median income, uh, very high poverty rate, uh, poor education outcomes, and a lot of other kind of indicators that point to this as being a, tr a truly disadvantaged community. So it's really a kind of a tale of two, two hillsides. Um, next slide. This work sits within uh, a program that's sponsored by the City of San Francisco and the Mayor's Office of Housing called Hope SF. So some of you may be familiar with Hope 6. It was a project under the Clinton administration to redevelop public housing throughout the country. Um, Hope SF is San Francisco's version of that program, as that program is no longer in existence. Federal funding for this kind of work is in steep decline, virtually non-existent. So it really is, it takes the, 
uh, innovation and, uh, um, and wealth, frankly, of a city like San Francisco to try and enact this without significant federal funds. One thing that's unique about uh, Hope SF as compared to Hope 6 is we're committed to ensuring that there's no loss of public housing. So there's 606 units on the site now, 606 replacement units will be built. So everybody who lives there now can occupy the new development. Not, not a characteristic of previous Hope 6 developments. Um, and so other opportunities involve residents, build a strong sense of community, and then use a market rate to cross-subsidize the improvements, both the, both the infrastructure and the affordable housing improvements on site. So that's that value recapture. We went through a very long community process. In fact, Bridge Housing, I wasn't at Bridge at the time. Uh, I was at the city of San Francisco, but Bridge Housing was selected in 2008 to do this work. 2008 was not a particularly propitious year to start uh, <laughs> development work, and so um, we've been in a very extended uh, community uh, uh, building process, uh, uh, community design process, um, and, and land use entitlement process, and we're, we're set to start construction at, uh, at the end of this year. But we went through a, a lot of community uh, engagement work, next slide, uh, participatory design, focus groups, uh, focusing on safety and sustainability, so a lot of community outreach and engagement was involved during the design phase. Go to the next slide. And we've—I won't go into it a lot here—but uh, Bridge Housing has been really actively engaged in in building community building, as we call it. Uh, this is a community that has experienced trauma in a number of forms: poverty, violence, neglect. And so recognizing that trauma and then building programs that seek to engage residents where they are, building trust, building relationships, is foundational to the development work that will follow. So it's, it's, not, it's not design work per se, but it, it is fundamental to having the trust and the buy-in with the residents as we initiate what is going to be a major, a major transformation of the community. So the program, 606 units are there now. It'll be approximately 1,600 units when we're all done. The public housing gets replaced. We'll build new affordable housing. This will be at a higher AMI or area median income. So slightly higher income residents, but still low income households. And then close to 800 market rate, uh, market rate units, along with um, retail, some limited retail child care center and parks and open space. So that's where you see the density. And here's a figure ground of, of, the, of the way the fabric is intended to be uh, transformed. You can see the, the kind of uh, distributed uh, bar-like buildings in the left, and then the, the, the regularized street grid on the right. Um, and then next slide. And here is that connectivity element, really trying to tie, despite the topography, trying to tie the, the existing community physically create connections with the surrounding neighborhood and, and address some of the isolation that the community has felt for the last more than half century. So here again, I mean, this is, this is um, the overall plan. Um, the blue represents market, the yellow represents affordable and public housing replacement. And this is, this is the notion, I mean, this is part of the underpinnings of this program is that we're going to more than double the density, uh, there's value in this land, in this area, especially in Petroa Hill, which is so well located. And that value, which will be about $100 million, will be used to help subsidize the affordable housing uh, and, the, and the infrastructure. For the so again, capturing that value for investment toward social ends. And then here it is now, and then that's what it'll look like, or some version of that. So those are, those are my comments. Again, I, I actually look forward to uh, Kirsten's work with the city will tie into this notion of uh, policies and frameworks that really help to provide uh, a social context to density uh, that I, I think is part and parcel of any conversation around uh, development in San Francisco. So, thanks very much. Thanks, sir. Have, we're going to go through all the speakers and then we'll have question and answer for all four of them after. That's okay. Uh, hi. Um, what I uh, will talk about is something that, that we do. One of the fears uh, of uh, uh, dense density is that it's going to you know, ruin everybody's lives, right? Because there'll be no light, there'll be uh, 
increased crime, mold will grow, grow on our skins because of the <laughs> horrifying and nature of density. Uh, in fact, San Francisco is a, you know, a dense city by American standards, but not by uh, worldwide standards. You know, we're 17, 18,000 people per square mile, and uh, Manhattan, for instance, is 70, Paris is around 50. Uh, Kowloon is 130,000. So there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, space here uh, to build, uh, and I think that there's a but there's a fear of any change. So uh, w what I'm going to do is just talk about the things we do and we disseminate these ideas. And it's very much a uh, I, Joe Esherick is a, a guy I always talked about his his dumb architecture. He's actually a very sophisticated architect, but. Uh, just had he stuck to the really simple things, so these are really simple. Uh, so we'll just go through them, and it's a list. You know, everybody loves lists. So uh, what we start out by the idea of uh, reweaving the urban family, uh, urban fabric. So that's actually the uh, Patrillo Hill project is a great example of that. And there's a tendency, actually, uh, modern architects uh, who were thinking really hard uh, didn't see the value in that, and basically all these public uh, plans that were done in the 50s and 60s, pretty much the first thing they did is sever all ties to the community, the next. So this, this is an example actually of public housing in Oakland, and this is what it was like. Uh, and you can see there on, on the lower left hand corner, there's some funny buildings. There was actually a fence around them that would close and they'd kind of either keep the cops out or keep the drug dealers in. It wasn't exactly clear, but uh, it wasn't a good situation. <laughs> So then you go here, and this is what we did, is, is we just uh, connected it to the grid. So very simple idea, uh, highly effective, and uh, yeah, they actually measured crime here, and crime went way down. There were no murders on site. Somebody was chased into the site and shot, you know. But it started up next door. But it was much better than before, where it was just a really uh, kind of horrible, violent place next. Uh, building uh, the bones, so we just talked talk about this and that uh, next, uh, that we like to do, do uh, volumetric moves with architecture. There's a big, actually, criticism right now about all the buildings being like giant boxes. And I think that has to come, that comes from uh, the kind of commodification of multifamily housing where you've got developers who figured out that, you know, unless you build the biggest box possible and you get fewer units and they're, they're pricing it that way. But it, it's producing uh, some pretty um, horrible, uh, well, maybe not horrible, but I think people are challenged by it. They don't like it. Uh, I think the other solution to this is, of course, is everybody gets VR goggles and doesn't go outside. And maybe that will be the future. But uh, until then, we want to make, have the uh, urban form be more diverse. So this is out in the Bayview. Next. Another one in the, in the Bayview. Uh, Utilizing is what we did here is just take the circulation and made it look as little like an apartment as possible. That little cube in the middle is actually a little uh, space for seniors to pause and uh, a little table in there and they could play bridge, hang out in the stairwell next. And then this is actually also in the Bayview. And these are this is senior affordable housing, and uh, it's very we had the two you know, multifamily housing is in the in the normal world quite, uh, how am I doing, faster? Yeah. Okay, uh, quite, you know, it's, it's, you're really trying to replicate. Uh, we're getting a lot of pressure now to modularize, which is gonna make it even more replicated. And what we did here is made this central volume as odd and squiggly as we possibly uh, could get. Squiggly being one of those words, I think, <laughs> if you've uh, taught that, that concept yet, that concept of squiggly. So next, uh, and then, so a little goes a long way. Now this is a really dumb one. Uh, it's just that uh, we find that there's a, a grinding uh, desire to build for less money. And one of the ways you do that is you use the crappiest materials, <coughs> the most uh, economical, excuse me, <laughs> materials you can. It's not bad, you know, that, that ends up as a, a cement plaster or stucco or this stuff called hardy board, which is a wonderful material. It's just, you know, you can have too much of a good thing. So we just have this 80-20 rule where we, we uh, lobby our clients to like, you know, put 20% of good stuff in there and uh, 
it's kind of like the hot pepper in the dish or, you know, it's like the makeup, whatever. It's going to look better. You don't have to, you know, be a mime and cover yourself with makeup to, to look better. Uh, so this is an example where on the left, that cement plaster, very, very cheap, and on the right, that's actually grind zinc. We wrote that in, never thinking we'd actually pulled it all the way through the project. Uh, and it probably wouldn't now in the new <coughs> extra aware uh, mayor's office of housing who are, have become seeker, seeker, seekers and destroyers of all cost wasting. <laughs> uh, nothing to do with Kristen. Anyway, so that's a really nice material. <laughs> Next. Uh, and then uh, also there's another one where this is uh, a, a local t um, thin tile place in City Hall there. And that's that one on the left. That's actually the micro units we're talking about, which are luxury micro units with 20% affordable on site. And then uh, another uh, good material, this being core tin in Mission Bay, a big kind of volume of core tin, which is really coming out. It's a super nifty thing. There's more effort put in that big volume than in the rest of the building. And we're hoping you won't know. No, you will notice everything, but this uh, heightens it. Next. So activate the edges. Uh, something uh, super important you know, is that the first 20 foot, the ground level, so you're just energizing the street. Uh, next, that can be a lot of things. I'm just going to show some pictures of, uh, of storefronts. That, that This is affordable housing for formerly homeless. Next, yeah, more of that. Actually, that was a, and the, the one before was uh, actually a, formerly homeless work program, teaching people how to do restaurant work. And then an immigrant running this, and he did his own design and his own construction. And then next is a, uh, right kitty corner, uh, this is, you know, you can get the $23 hamburger here, and it's really quite nice. So this is all coexisting and uh, very active and, and uh, sharing, uh, sharing economic levels. Next. So be welcoming, uh, so that is, just make it, and this is a really dumb idea, but uh, make the front door really nice and you can find it and it's, it's a grand and, and gracious and welcomes people and honors people, uh, whether they're rich people or poor people or a combination. Next. So uh, this is a portal, it's a Union City BART, and uh, you enter into, so it's a public portal, you enter into it, and then uh, it's a Feng Shui decompression zone is the other idea we have here where you're in the public space before you get to the security level next. Uh, again in the Bayview with this uh, big shield thing and a, rope, a transition zone. Uh, this is formerly homeless families in the Bayview you know, the, and youth aging out of foster care which is a big producer of homeless people, the foster care system. Like, now 50% of people come out of foster care become homeless. It's crazy. Next. Uh, and then this is the uh, luxury bike garage, uh, so that you uh, go in, these people are paying $1,500 a square foot, and they get a nice bike garage right by their front door, just like they lived in Sweden. Uh, and this is Hayes Valley. Next. Uh, create synergies. So uh, this is just putting things together on that ground level so that you get an, an, re, a, a multiplier effect of good. So next. Uh, this is a uh, you know, public space, uh, the laundry room, and this is a children's play area with the giant concrete gorillas. It's actually a top lot, but uh, teenagers can, can drink beer while sitting on them as well. Next, uh, and then this just shows uh, this is a computer lab and laundry, and uh, the TV room, which was basically become the Xbox room, where this is formerly homeless families and the building manager because their grade point of the kids was lower. It took 120 kids to live in this 80-unit uh, apartment and told them they, there was no more Xbox until they got their grades up by like one point. She's a pretty involved manager. Next. Uh, and then community gardens, which are, this is on a mid-rise, eight-story building. Uh, this is for TNDC. Really uh, took a lot to talk people into it and it's become super, people love it. Uh, they, they have a this, this nonprofit developer has a program where they uh, organize people communally and grow food and distribute it next. And then this is more of that seniors and 
formerly homeless seniors in Oakland, uh, their community room, and there's actually uh, urban agriculture out there as well. And then enlightened circulation, just making your circulation is uh, not like Las Vegas, uh, so that you can see out, and ideally so that it's not conditioned. That's something we always try to push, though. Sometimes we win that, sometimes we don't. Next. So if you can see the light uh, through here, you can see in from the street. Next. Uh, this is actually in Sacramento. It's open air. That's the lobby. So that's, uh, that's a core 10 screen. Next. And then, actually, this is in West Sacramento. Again, uh, uh, open air circulation, really. So you feel not like you're in a big building or in a project, but it's a community. Next. So get personal. Next. Um, so this is Mr. Wong there with his plant and a little shelf. And then to the left, somebody has a little Maneki Neko and a plant. Something that uh, we do on the apartments is put it. And actually, the one on the right, it's steel, so they can use magnets and chalk on it as well. And then the one on the left has a little clip. Uh, next up, uh, yeah, so this is in, uh, going, going from the community. This is using uh, African fabrics and the color scheme. And those are drink of symbols on the wall. So hooking into that, that uh, African American community. Next. Uh, and then art for all. Uh, next. Just uh, using art in the projects. And this, we work a lot with uh, uh, Creativity Explored. And uh, using these are uh, disabled, developmentally disabled artists. This is actually within the uh, homeless, formerly homeless senior project. This is um, the seniors are making art. They have art classes. Next, uh, and then this is uh, uh, more of this is uh, again from Creativity Explored. Next, and no fences. So don't fence things off. And next, so this is. The, the one in Oakland where people from the community, is there were no gates. Uh, the, the, it was interesting that the people who made this happen were actually the police because they said, well, I don't want to chase that young guy across a fence. I want to radio the other squad car and have him intercepted. So if you put a big high fence, he goes right over it. And I, don't, I can't do that. It ruins my uniform or I simply can't <laughs> climb the 12-foot fence. Next. So it's all open. Uh, this is a, a street, public street. Uh, in San Jose, with uh, actually has social services uh, off it and a swimming pool, and then doors to the uh, to the uh, apartment buildings, lobbies. Next, uh, this is in Charleston. It's a porch, a single house porch. So seniors, it's a combination com combining uh, uh, the, a porch with the fire exit, so people can sit out there and uh, in their rocking chairs, which they do in South Carolina. I mean in Charleston. Yeah, next. It's all about the people, so just think that you, it's all people that in these buildings. And uh, actually, you change lives with all kinds of housing. Next. Uh, so these are, these are kids, formerly homeless kids. You give them a place to study, and they start graduating from high school. Next. Uh, daycare, actually off that street, uh, or early childhood development, as you should be called. Next. Uh, these kids are uh, growing vegetables next to Tasaparanga, and they, uh, the money goes towards a college fund. They sell the vegetables. Uh, fantastic thing. Uh, uh, Act a non verba, non profit. Next. Uh, just the folks who uh, at the, in San Jose, really uh, 11 languages spoken in this particular community. Next. Uh, those are the seniors making art in Oakland. Next. Uh, these are this is these are actually people who do uh, senior. Uh, it's when the parents get sent to jail. What happens to the kids? So these hook up the grandparents with the kids. Uh, really fantastic women uh, and a, a critical thing. And that's actually uh, on a street. So their social agency is on this public street. So there's no gate you go through the next. Okay, that's it. Okay, Thank you. Long. from the planning department. It's great to be here. I really enjoy the collaboration um, and getting outside of the bureaucratic box and working with CCA and really hearing a different perspective on this really important question. This is 
the number one challenge for our long-range planning team. There are about 40 of us. We work on a number of issues, but we organize our work program around challenges. And we're going to talk about housing today, but I really wanted to acknowledge that this is a bigger issue than just housing. It's about transportation services, public education. There's a lot of dimensions to making sure that we remain an equitable and inclusive society. Next slide. So, um, but then there's this question about housing. And, you know, this isn't really a new question. We have been seeing a reorganization of population for several de several years, a decade or so. It's not a new question, but it is a more challenging question as more people come. So this is our first generation of responding to the reorganization. These are major area plans. Um, and San Francisco, like every urban city in the US and around the world, the first place we turned when we saw this influx of population was the low-hanging fruit, our former industrial lands. And then we were lucky enough to have a freeway fall down we had even more opportunity there up on Octavia Boulevard. We accomplished the capacity for uh, 30,000 housing units in this area and lots of commercial and office space. Even when we build that fully out, it doesn't help us reach our total housing needs, certainly not the housing needs that Ted Egan suggested would help us alleviate um, costs through supply alone. So that's our first place we started. Uh, just to finish, those plans started in the late 90s and were implemented or adopted, legislated in the late 2000, in fact, 2008. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we're moving on to the next generation of planning for housing. Next slide. So this is the palette that our team has started with. There are dozens of zoning districts throughout the city. Um, the yellow areas, which are about 73% of the city are single family or two unit districts. So that's a large portion of the city. But you can see we have a lot of different controls. The evolution of the San Francisco planning code is probably a, a 10 hour story. But at the end of the day, most of the city, except for what we saw on that previous slide, has not been rezoned since the late 70s. So we we were operating in a city that was zoned for loss of population. We saw people rapidly moving to the suburbs at that time. We also were in a great battle. All of the historians when they talk about San Francisco's land use in that period talk about the downtown versus the neighborhoods dynamic. There was this big fear, and the word was used often, of Manhattanizing the whole city. So I like to describe it as the great deal where we agreed to shellac the neighborhoods, just zone them down, add height limits, add density limits, and then allow downtown to grow in the 80s. And that's exactly what we did, and we haven't, as a city, chosen to look back on the rest of the city. Our team gets to start with that question, and knowing that there are many residents who are vested and believe in the controls that were developed in the late 70s, um, and maybe they even see it as the perfect vision or the complete vision of San Francisco. So we're entering into that conversation. Next slide. <clears throat> um, so these are all of the parcels that are um, have buildings that are above their existing density limit. I just point this out to say that when we shellacked the city to the on the west side, we did it very quickly. We did it without a lot of information. We meant to match what was there, but there are a number of buildings that are already out of context if you take that position. Next slide. And of course, um, we also did some analysis about heights. This is some work we did with David Baker Architects around looking at height patterns. The red line shows the existing height limit. Here's a building that was built in the 1920s that of course is uh, three stories above its permitted height limit, and that blue line is the two stories that Anya alluded to that our program would be able to. So there are buildings that are above the existing height limit, and there are buildings that are above the dis existing density limit. This is an important new set of information almost to the narrative in San Francisco around what is the role of zoning. It isn't a finished product for the city, but it's really a way to regulate growth in response to population demands on the economy. Next slide. Um, I really like to just point out how this happened. I think one of the prompts Chris and Niraj gave me and Anya were 
how does design play a role in responding to equality and affordability? And for me, I think there are a lot of speakers that can talk in more detail about it, but for me, it's the public perception of that work, and all of the policy that I work with is scar tissue from one bad building, or one bad year of building, or one bad decade, or whichever. So this is, by historians, often referred to as sort of the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of San Francisco, after this, build, this site was redeveloped, there was a neighborhood call for height limits and density limits and like the stopping of the spread of downtown. So uh, this is over on Van Essen Bay Street and the next slide um, shows the building that replaced that. Um, I'm not a designer so I'm not going to comment, but others have said that this building maybe uh, was not context sensitive and that was part of what responded, what caused all this upset mess. Uh, we can have a great conversation about that. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to you know, kind of say one of the responsibilities of the actions we take on these individual projects is sort of communicating with the public uh, and the community members around how density feels and how it can work. And so if we do it in the right order, I really like the approach our class last semester took of thinking about it holistically with infrastructure with all of those pieces and that's pretty critical okay next slide so um, we've done a lot of work um, our team thinking about how to fit more people into the city um, Chris and Naraj talked about our work on secondary units there's some other things we're doing in terms of looking at our existing buildings which we all value a lot um, to add more density, but I'm going to really spend most of the time talking about our new construction program. And this is, it's called the Affordable Housing Bonus Program, which I, it's a terrible name and a terrible acronym. Um, but uh, so this program is really, going back to Dan's point, all about creating an, um, additional development potential and then recapturing that value in the form of affordable housing. So in the city of San Francisco, and in many cities, uh, developers are currently required to provide a certain percent of affordable units. In San Francisco, it's 12%. We want to bring that up to a higher level, so creating this value is sort of the mechanism we've used. Next slide. So this is our program area. We started by looking at everything that hasn't been rezoned since the 1970s, except for our single family and two unit districts. We made that choice for political reasons, but we also made that choice because the context there, you know, increasing density, the, the political fight versus the number of units you might get are maybe not worth that trade-off. Um, many people in this room have nudged me to then ask, what's the question for RH1 and RH2, so that may be the next class. Um, this, this program area already includes 30,000 um, parcels. Most of them are neighborhood commercial corridors. They're all um, pretty close to rapid transit network, walkable distance, about a quarter mile. So that's really important because our city is learning how to manage all the new people. And while we're thinking about where to house them, MTA and the Transit Authority are thinking about how to move people around more efficiently, effectively. So it's great that we're building on the corridors that they're building transit capacity on. This is a soft sites program. I think there was some um, laughing when we had that constraint around the class last semester, but really demolishing existing units in San Francisco is a very complicated and, and unappreciated gesture, I would say. So. Um, a lot of it has to do with historic preservation concerns, and a lot of it has to do with displacement. And at this particular moment in San Francisco's uh, housing policy conversation, displacement is a real issue, and anything that gets sort of associated with potentially displacing people is unpalatable, I would say. So this is one of the soft sites. I mean, uh, you can see here at Geary and Desidero, it's a parking lot. Um, ever since I started this program, work on this two years ago, as I walk around the city, I kind of notice them. You probably do too, but they're, they're a little bit silent. There's another one. 
and this is actually not in the program area, but it's a, an example of the type of single story commercial building that could easily house a six or eight story building and add several new residents. Um, so we identified about 240 soft sites throughout our program area. So of that full 30,000, if we only developed without demolishing any residential units, we'd see about 240 new buildings over the period of the program. If those sites were developed under their controls today, we'd see about 7,400 new units, and the program we're proposing could enable about 16,000 units. So that's a pretty significant increase in the development potential of the city. But to that point, going back to the value recapture, as our amount of residential units go up, also our percent of affordability goes up. So we're able to um, have 5,000 permanently affordable units where we would otherwise only be seeing 900 permanently affordable units. So this is the program in summary. Um, not going to spend a lot of time on it. We have about, we have three different program options. The first two are mixed income program <coughs> options. The first is really just implementing the state law. It's pretty basic. It gets people to about 13% affordable housing or 20%. Um, and only a 35% increase. I heard Dan say something about doubling the density in Petraro. The local program on many sites doubles the density on many of our 240 sites. And that's actually um, a, good, a good touch point for value recapture because then you're actually able to significantly increase, increase that percentage uh, while, keep, while keeping in the same construction type. But those projects, oh sorry, those projects are able to um, be relieved completely of their density controls, and they're offered two additional stories of height. So it's a significant upzoning to achieve that. For our 100% affordable projects, like the ones Dan and David walked you through, we're offering as much incentive and benefit as we can. We really want to maximize our public investment. While we're value engineering, we're also increasing potential, so uh, we can really get as many units as possible. So those are able to get three stories of height. Um, David Baker Architects was uh, our lead consultant on this project. Um, it, we spent a lot of time analyzing our old planning code and trying to really figure out what was there, what was on the ground. There were a lot of instances where the height limits allowed you to be here, but the density limits constrained you and vice versa. There's a, a really big mismatch, which to me showed um, a lack of analysis or consideration when the code was really born in that way. Um, this is what you could build on one of the soft sites that we've tested. Um, right now, under current rules, you can have about 15 units and a 50-foot building. The red line is the current height limit. The blue line is two stories above. And then the next slide shows you that same building with relief of density controls and just two stories of height. And there you've got 46 units of housing rather than the 15 and a 75-foot building. So um, I guess I would just close by saying uh, this is the program that we are trying to legislate through the process. This is, uh, we have, well, I think we've had like five public hearings and we've been all over the political map in terms of how the program is received. Um, but, but it is not an easy work, and I think the reason is this land that we're working on is more contested than our last work. We're, formerly, we were working in former industrial areas. Now we're going into neighborhoods where people feel vested, they feel ownership, it's their community. And even though the impact will be really small, it will be these infill sites, it just shows sort of the sensitivity of the next frontier of questions that you have when you're thinking about urban infill. So um, I think design is critical to that. I mean, if Amanda David's staff were here, she would say, we didn't design this building, we just sketched it out. Part of our program is also a series of design guidelines, a lot of things to provide assurance both for the community and for um, our staff that we're going to continue to see good, good um, product as we open up the door. So I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Okay. I have flyers, I mean um, handouts.
and um, try to hand them out, especially at the back. I don't really have enough for everybody, obviously. Okay, great. Guys, thank you so much for having me. This has been fascinating. I'm really thrilled. Um, so yeah, right to the city, it's a pretty literally. If you have a job, family, friends, property, an affinity group, or you just feel like this is the right place for you, that's right to the city. Um, cities traditionally, since the dawn of capitalism, have been places that people flock to. They're engines of opportunity. Um, I do want to challenge the idea that inequality is a sign of an unsuccessful city. Actually, if you think about it, living cities are by their nature, almost by their definition, unequal. Like, there are places like Atherton um, or Car Carmel, they have very low inequality because everyone is rich and you can't live there if you're poor. <laughs> or where I came from, Philadelphia has much less inequality than here, but that's because no one there is rich. I left Philadelphia. I left a place of equality because I needed to come somewhere where there was opportunity and I'm not the only one. I absolutely think that it's our responsibility to, to maximize residential square footage and even office square footage, to tell you the truth, um, to keep building as people are flocking here to accommodate them. Next. So yeah, my talk is about politics, right? So your desired outcomes, you may have a more specific desired outcome than you know, maximize built square footage. Um, people in my group are not design professionals. It's a lot of like tech workers. So we're kind of like, whatever you think you want to build, just go ahead. Uh, residential <coughs> really though. We don't go to bat for office or retail. Um, it's a little hard to see. That's why I'm glad that at least some of you are going to have this flyer. I came at this two years ago. I really didn't know anything about politics or how it works at all. But I've learned, this is the picture I drew um, of what I learned. So you think about what your desired outcome is. Oh, the black is kind of like the formal structure, and the red is the public conversation. What we're doing now is part of the public conversation. Right, when you go to a talk and you learn something and you talk to your friends about it later, or if you, if you write something on Medium, or if you share an article on Facebook, or if you go to public comment that is absolutely part of the public, com of the public conversation, you'd be very surprised how many people are actually watching that, live streaming it. Um, the public conversation affects voters, obviously, but it also affects our electeds. Electeds are also on Facebook. They have friends, they go to dinner parties, they have conversations, and they um, also affect our commissioners. So if all you want to do is be part of the public conversation, that's fine, that's a thing. That's what I was doing before I started organizing people to testify in front of commissions. I eventually felt like that wasn't enough for me. So if you decide it's not enough for you, I'll tell you what else you can do. Um, you have your desired outcomes, and maybe you're going to have something more specific, like the worst thing about con uh, new high-rises is that those are actually gated communities. I feel like it would be really cool if we had some, um, I guess, design, more than design guidelines that force uh, new high-rises to actually be accessible all throughout, right? Like if you have public parks and retail on the top floors and public elevators or whatever. Something like that maybe is your idea. That's my idea, but that's the idea I want you to have. Um, the way that you would get that is you would have to figure out what laws you would need to get that outcome. You would have to, you would have to, oh yeah, you notice that decisions also to affect your desired outcomes. So maybe a building like that would go before the planning commission. And it's an unusual thing to put public retail on the top floor. So the commissioners would have to be open to that idea. And so you would be like, oh, which commissioners do we want um, appointed so that they make the decisions we want so that we get the outcomes we want. Now, electeds are, are a huge node here, right? Because they write laws. And they also themselves make, make decisions. There was actually a lot of projects that are heard before the Board of Supervisors, like 5M was a huge project. 160 Folsom is getting an upzoning, so they have to go to um, the Board of Supervisors. Um, and the electeds also appoint commissioners. So it's obviously that's a node. So how do we get, how do we get the people that we want in office. The way that we know about is through voting, and I put a dotted line there because our instinct is that voting is like kind of effective, and your instinct is right. But there's a much more effective kind of voting, which is you join clubs, the clubs make endorsements, and then the endorsements help the electeds um, get into office. And that does not take that much time. 
What it takes is you picking someone that knows about this stuff and then doing what they tell you to do when it's time to do it. And that is the way you can really leverage your vote, get your electeds in office so you can get your desired outcomes. Next, please. So here's an example of the picture I drew. Um, for example, the SFM Democrats is a club. If you are 35 or under, if you live or work in San Francisco, you can join it. I suggest everyone do that if you're qualified. Um, in January, they had their members, all of their members were allowed to come and vote on who the SF Young Democrats should endorse for state senate. Me and 139 other young Dems voted to endorse Scott Wiener. Um, 90 something, I don't think actually 96 is right, but it's 90 something for Jane Kim. Uh, Scott Wiener won that endorsement. Now, the Young Democrats is a huge Democratic club. It has 27 delegates. It's a huge chunk of delegates. And Scott had like, you know, gone around and got endorsements from many smaller clubs. One or two delegates here or there. But he really needed those 27 to cement his state, um, his state, the state club endorsement. Um, he got them because me and 139 other people voted. Only 250 people voted, or less, 240. Uh, he got the state Democratic Party endorsement, which is worth eight points in the final election, which is 40,000 votes, which is insane. You have less than 250 people deciding, ultimately, how 40,000 people are going to wind up voting. I consider myself to have voted for Scott Wiener 286 times, and I don't even live in San Francisco. I am registered to vote in Oakland. So this is, this is really really intense vote leveraging, and there's nothing wrong with it. You could look at this and be like, oh, this is so un undemocratic. Or you could look at it and be like, wow, a small number of people are making decisions. I want to be one of those people. And you can be. <laughs> um, next. Okay, so here's one that's coming up. If you feel sad that you missed January, the, and this is, this is actually only for people that are registered to vote in uh, San Francisco. So if you're not registered to vote, register. It doesn't matter if you don't have a driver's license here. A lot of people think that. That's false. You could move here today. You can register to vote today. It's fine. But you have to register as a Democrat. If you mess around and register as an independent, then you exclude yourself from participation and stuff like this. It's not worth it. I don't think it's worth it. So Democratic Central Committee. There's, this is, <laughs> there's like 28 people on it. If you live in Eastern SF, if you're, does anybody recognize the name David Chu? Yeah. No? Okay, that's fine. Well, if David Chu is your representative, then you have 14 people you can vote for. If Phil Tang is your representative, then you vote for 10 people. Um, not that many people vote in this. It's like very obscure. Um, so this is, you know, vote leveraging. Um, so you will, you'll vote for your people and then well, the reason this is important is the DCCC is the governing body of our local party. And then they are going to make endorsements. In November, all of the odd district supervisor elections are up. That's a lot. Um, plus BART board elections. You know, BART is our transit. Um, and, and then a bunch of ballot measures. No one knows how many it will be. There's going to be a lot. So when you, I mean, if there's a ballot measure you like, or if there's a, a, uh, somebody running for the supervisor that you like, you're going to want to vote for the people on DCCC who are going to vote to endorse you know, your candidate. That way it'll be much easier for them to win and much easier for them to raise money. Now this is why we actually have parties. Because this is much more... In the previous example, I was voting straight for Scott Wiener and that just that was the endorsement. That was the whole process. You know, now I'm voting for a person, and then the person is going to vote for the endorsement, and it's they're less reliable. They're like, how do I know you're really going to do it when push comes to shove? This is why you see the party structure start to emerge. Um, there's going to be a slate of people like in my coalition that I'm going to vote for. Anyway, next one. Oh yeah. So who do you dis right? Who do you want endorsed? This one, I kind of almost want to go and point to it. So this is a bunch of different laws that are, look, this is the Affordable Housing Bonus Program that you guys already heard a lot about. 
This is neighborhood commercial districts. Oh shoot. That was me trying to stay under 10 minutes, but I'll finish up. Do you guys already know what form-based zoning is? Form-based zoning. <laughs> um, Form-based zoning, the idea is, is that we have these arbitrary density limits here and there. And so you might be like, oh my god, I can build whatever, 10,000 square feet. Oh my goodness, I'm limited to a quadplex. And then that's crazy. That's too big. I mean, your units are too big. So form-based zoning gets rid of the arbitrary density limits. And um, the city is piecemeal kind of instituting it here and there. Um, along the Visadero, we have some new form-based zoning. London Breed, the current District 5 uh, representative, sponsored that bill and is a champion of it, right? So here's a law I like. This is a supervisor. She is still running. So this is the supervisor that I want to endorse because she's doing the outcomes that I want, you know? Um, the Affordable Housing Bonus Program, I also favor. Um, Scott Weiner had this no CUs for 100% BMR. This is basically like process reform for affordable housing. It's another thing I like. Just another example of, you know, so he's, so he, that's one of the reasons why I was like, okay, I want to vote for him for state senate. Um, on the other side, we have this, <laughs> we have other candidates. So Dean Preston is also running for District 5, but he's organizing people against both affordable housing bonus program and the NCT. So that's how I know this is not someone that, that I want. He's not supporting the stuff that I, the outcomes I want. Um, David Campos is the current supervisor for D9. He's termed out, um, but he's also opposed the affordable housing bonus program. And his legislative aide testified against this process reform for affordable housing, which I thought was pretty stunning. <coughs> the Coalition for San Francisco Neighborhoods was founded by Calvin Welch. Calvin Welch, remember we talked about this down zoning in the 70s? In 1971, his neighborhood group um, passed the first like big down zoning in the hate. So Calvin Welch and this neighbor, so there's a bigger, he has a small neighborhood group in the hate, but he's a co-founder of the Coalition for San Francisco Neighborhoods. Their mission is to oppose height limit increases and density increases. Right? So they're like the opposite of everything that I believe in. Um, and the author of a lot of the, you know, the down zoning and like anti-building that we see. He's also a co-founder of community, council of community housing organizations, which is also against the affordable housing bonus program. Um, so this is like kind of like a map of a small part of San Francisco's like political layout and explains a little bit why I had to start my organization because the tenants union is also against the affordable housing bonus program and Dean Preston founded this thing called Tenants Together. So there was, I mean, I definitely consider shortage to be a renter's issue. Like, we have really no power if we have no choice, if we have nowhere to go. Um, and the existing tenant organizations are coming out against uh, policies that would add residential square footage. So that's why I needed to start my organization, so that pro-density tenants had something they could do. Um, Oh, this is just a short note. Sorry, this was an awkward thing. So this, <laughs> this, this affordable housing process reform, as you might expect, was supported by Mercy Housing, who builds affordable housing. And I made a mistake. I thought Bridge Housing, oh, Bridge Housing also supported it. Um, Mercy Housing is a member of Choo Choo. And Choo Choo, so Choo Choo couldn't be opposed to it, even though Calvin Welch, its founder, was opposed to it, because its members were in, in favor of it. So there's like inside of Choo Choo, if you keep watching the news, if you pay attention, there's this tension inside of there. It really, in the next few years, might break apart. All right, yeah, so what are your issues? You decide what kind of, what is your outcome you want to achieve? What club, so you're all probably in clubs. Maybe like your knitting club or your basketball club is totally apolitical, but some of your other clubs might be somewhat political, especially especially this group. So I would recommend, actually, you guys get involved in the political process, create an endorsement process. You don't have to, in, you don't have to endorse in every single race, but pick races that you think that your members care about. Make endorsements, publish your endorsements. Um, some normal ways that people make endorsements is sometimes they send out questionnaires. For the ballot measure campaigns, call the campaign, they will send somebody out. There's somebody whose job it is just to go to every single club and talk to you. 
Um, candidates usually will also come out, but it's not as reliable. Um, yeah, and then you can, if it's a small club, you should just discuss among yourselves. If it's a big club, vote on it. And this will get, like, San Francisco is a pretty small town. When you make an endorsement, if you tell the person or ballot measure that you're endorsing that you endorse them, suddenly you're on their radar in a way that's going to really surprise you. Like clubs of like 12 people can go meet with supervisors and get a hearing. It's very, very accessible. This picture is from Swimmy. Do you guys recognize this? This is an international picture of Organize. Um, all right, well, thank you so much. So we have uh, maybe five, ten minutes, so it's a very short amount of time, but if there's any questions for any of our presenters today um, in the audience, please, please feel free to speak up. Yep. Emily? Question uh, for Kirsten. Um, so the last slide that you showed um, was uh, with the Sorry, the previous slide was 15 okay. without the two stories, and then it moves up to, I don't have it memorized, 46 units. Okay, so I guess one of the questions that I, I had was, um, what are the types of units um, that you're projecting when you start thinking about um, what's going on for these health sites, and what size are they? That's a great question, and that's actually a conversation we've been having a lot, minimum unit size. We do have a requirement that 40% of the units be two bedroom or more, um, and we installed that in the eastern neighborhoods and all of those eastern plans when we um, removed density, because we wanted to make sure we didn't get all single unit building, or single unit uh, apartments. Um, there have been some questions about whether there should be a size box see floor to the size because we are having units that used to be a thousand square feet now coming in at 700 800 square feet per unit um, some people are very in support of that other people feel like we don't want to un unnecessarily constrain those unit sizes so the city hasn't really come to a conclusion in that conversation um, a lot of our affordable housing funds do have minimum unit sizes but because they're statewide programs, they're so much bigger than what we're, our market is producing, they don't really make sense. For our modeling purposes, we assume, I think, an average gross square foot of 800 to 1,200, depending on the neighborhood. And that's a two-bedroom? Uh, it's a mix 40% too, yeah. It's really big by the national standards. Uh, just to kind of tail into the last question about soft sites, you talked about the kind of identification of these as being political. I was wondering if you could talk about uh, the process of the <coughs> categorization a bit more thoroughly, and also why you might exclu exclude something that would otherwise be categorized as a soft site. Sure. Uh, we did a, a reductive analysis, so we started with the 30,000. The first thing we took out was like historic resources, because we don't demolish those. And then we took out sensitive sites like schools and churches, sort of anything that you know the owner of the property would likely maintain the use for. And then we do um, an analysis of the ratio of the current building to what would be allowed under the program. And this is what we used in our Easter neighborhoods to predict where growth would happen. And so we, we've tested it. It works pretty well. And usually if building, the existing building is more than 30% or even more than 5% of the potential, it's not really worth it or development isn't going there yet. Maybe in 20, 30 years it would. So sort of the volume is a good indicator. These are all estimates. So the program is available for the whole area, but we're guessing, our best guess is these are the sites that it would happen. More recently, um, uh, Supervisor Bree, who Sonia talked about a little bit, um, introduced an amendment that said if there are any rent control units on a parcel, then they would be ineligible for the program. So that gets back to this whole not wanting to cause displacement, especially for affordable units. So you said 240 sites you ended up with. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? I have a question for all the speakers. Um, 
you know, we, I mean, first of all, I think uh, it was really, really interesting to see all the presentations, especially for us coming from outside San Francisco. It took actually some time to, to really understand the, the city beyond uh, some, for us, quite, quite impressive contradiction. I mean, one uh, is, uh, which is quite outstanding for us, is how there is this incredible concern for um, not ruining the city or not, you know, density, and how you have, uh, you know, luxury of vacancy. I mean, I've never seen a city with so much parking lots uh, all over the city, even actually in, in parts of the city that are supposed to be very dense and occupied. And in any other city, I think I think, I think it would be not really a, a big problem to to actually densify the city without actually even bothering anybody. I mean, not even with noise and 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 and, and building sites. So, I mean, this is actually one strong contradiction. The second one is, in a way, uh, you know, I think that San Francisco seems to have two two souls. Uh, I mean, one is the city beautiful souls, you know, a very nice city, uh, Victorian, uh, you know, whatever, you know, very picturesque in a way, and it, San Francisco seems to be very pride, and sometimes use actually also this as an excuse uh, to not allow, you know, further density. Uh, I mean, there is a lot of preservation uh, pressure that, uh, I mean, for me sounds a bit sometimes exaggerated, uh, <laughs> to be very, let's say, polite. <laughs> um, and you know we have like a, a major housing crisis with people not able to afford basically to live in the city, and there are people who are obsessed about birds, uh, you know, crossing through the city and preserving, you know, areas for them to reproduce themselves. You know these kind of things. And um, and then of course you know the other soul is actually San Francisco is a city that was full of conflicts, social conflicts. Um, you know, movements that really question actually the way, actually since the beginning of its foundation, the city was really privatized. It was exploited by basically the famous uh, labor uh, barons who actually literally owned the city and, you know, asked Diego Rivera to come and pay Morales to basically legitimize their own basically uh, social and political power of the city. But also how there was a lot of reaction to that, I mean, including the gay uh, counter movements, and I wonder where this legacy has gone. I mean, it seems to me that today San Francisco has returned to a kind of city beautiful uh, ideology and the whole countercultural class conflicts that really has shaped the city is, is, is kind of gone. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe it's a very naive uh, impression. I would like to ask maybe the speakers to to react to my very naive uh, comments. <laughs> It's not naive because it is it is a it's a it's a very strange mixture. Um, you know, we had uh, the pleasure of having a gentleman, uh, Devin McCutcheon, um, who's a historian at um, UCLA. UCLA, yeah. Um, who's doing a kind of um, oral history of uh, of planning in San Francisco um, as a as his doctoral um, research, and he came and spoke to our studio and spent a lot of time with San Francisco planning. And talked about how in San Francisco, um, you know, especially since the the 50s and 60s, there has been this very unique and strange marriage of that progressive, uh, unbelievably progressive kind of social um, uh, political movement with the historic preservation and, and anti-development uh, movement, and and it's been a, a a match made in hell, or you know, depending on how you look at it. Um, that has persisted um, throughout time, um, and you know, and 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 really um, defines the context within which you know these these debates are are framed um, in the city. Um, but another interesting point that that I never um, uh, had heard made uh, that he he was proposing was that those two souls of San Francisco, in a way, actually. Are symbiotic. They need each other, and he, he pointed to this whole history of how, you know, even as early as um, you know the the 60s and 70s, the the city chamber of commerce, you know the the kind of uh, most important organization in terms of you know capitalism and the you know kind of development of the city 
uh, for commerce would picture um, cable cars and Victorian houses and, and all of those sort of picturesque, city beautiful uh, elements uh, that form our image of the city um, as a way of attracting big businesses to move here and you know bring their workers and whatnot. And so he, he claims that there's actually this kind of codependency between uh, the kind of forces of um, you know commerce and development on the one hand and you know preservation and uh, uh, tourism um, on the other and, it, and it's it's a very strange mixture that I, I you know I think has result I don't know it, it's it's resulted in in, in the very um, uh, almost uh, contradictory way that we talk about you know density and and and, and the right to the city and, and inequality in this city yeah, it's generational too though I think Generational? Well, like Calvin, uh, you know, he's a progressive, yeah, very radical person who bought his house in the 70s. <laughs> he has a duplex. <laughs> yeah, and he's, uh, and he described the affordable housing density program as ethnic cleansing. But in a kind of, oh my gosh. You know, it may be a little over the top. I don't know. Some it's of what I think top. you're seeing is that a lot of the fights, um, were won by the, the social experimentation side, and so there was really no fight anymore, right? Like, no, who's against gay marriage? Like, who's against <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, sorry. <laughs> well, if you're against marriage, I feel like here, the main people that are against gay marriage are people that are against marriage. So, I mean, that's the fight right now in the gay community, I think. Um, actually, especially on this point, I think that's, uh, I mean, another main issue that provoke just the, the presentations. I mean, I think there was much more at stake than, than gay marriage. I mean, I think that there is a whole history of uh, American progressive experimentation that even tried to go beyond the family. Yes. And what I see now, actually, in yeah. all these presentations about communities and neighborhoods, is all about happy families. And, and there is a kind of, I mean, there is a lot of progressivism in, in activism, but I see a lot of conservative actually backfiring in, in how we imagine actually how we live together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, this, con this kind of concept of communities which are, you know, very standardized social groups, all with the same desires, all with the same, you know, coffee shops and bicycle uh, workshops, and, <laughs> you know. I mean, that's, that's really, uh, for me, the problem. And actually, you know, San Francisco was a city that would, in, you know, in the past would challenge all of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I actually have thought about the 70s a lot because this was the period when we did all this down zoning. But it's also a period where San Francisco and the Bay Area's conservation movement was really strong. We had Save the Bay, we had CEQA, which is our, like, statewide environmental review law. And I've always really wanted to spend more time thinking about whether the like stream of thinking that came from Sierra Club type conservation in the progressive movement have created sort of this culture of shellac everything and that is the progressive stance that we're still sort of fighting against culturally because there's, there was this amazing, I think you would enjoy, public comment session at one of our hearings where there were like maybe a hundred commenters, let's say, for a conversation. Fifty were opposed, fifty were in support. You could tell by age who what they were going to say. And there was this great conversation happening between the commenters. Well, there might be buildings that shade my backyard. Well, I don't even have a backyard. I'd love to have that. Like so this conversation is happening and it is very generational to think that's I think also they you know, we're San Francisco is one of a hundred cities in the Bay Area. So we have an integrated economy, but our land use decisions are made hyper-local. And so I, I think part of, and so you know, if, while it's true that there may be certain uh, cultural uh, history that informs a kind of anti-progressive progressiveness, pro progressivism in San Francisco, it's the same conversation in every town in this region. No development. If you go, there are 20 cities in San Mateo County, just to the south of here, you know, and then who knows how many cities in Santa Clara. That's where Facebook is. That's where all the job growth is happening. They are not. They are not building at all. I mean, compared to San Francisco, you know, we're like we're Manhattanized compared to them. So, um, so I think 
the, 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 the unit of governance is mismatched to the scale of the problem. Mm -hmm. And as the unit of governance gets smaller, the conservative impulse increases. Mm -hmm. And so I think we, that's where I think we really struggle. Mm -hmm. and it's not the same. I wanted to follow up on that question. And, uh, and really, I, I, I really think the question of aesthetics, and I want to kind of oppose that as a kind of a provocation. To what extent is it also a, um, an inability to propose um, an alternative aesthetics of, of the city or of, of life in the city. And I'm not only talking visually, but visually is a place to start, but I'm also talking about in literature, in music. I mean, if I were to think the aesthetics of the Bay Area, it would be the iPhone. And I love the iPhone. It's like I sleep with it. But it's very strange, like, uh, very kind of uh, contained about it. So, so I wonder, how, how can we propose you know, new aesthetics? and, and to what extent it is even possible to do that? Because we see in schools like this, or in Berkeley where I'm coming from, there are people every year that, that uh, every thesis year, they, they're incredibly uh, outrageous, beautiful, ugly, whatever you want to call it, but they have aesthetic uh, propositions. But something happens down the line, and that never really comes out <laughs> anywhere in the city. So I'm curious about that. Well, yeah. I, mean, I, uh, Go ahead. I, I just, I mean, I, I think there is, you know, it's interesting going to a place like Houston or LA, you see an architecture that's much more um, uh, radical, I think, as, as objects in the landscape. Because a lot of the progressive architects or cutting edge architects are not based in San Francisco. David Baker um, is an exception. But, you know, I think there's, there's something about the small, t the sense that we've got this little gem that we have to preserve. Like it was, there's a, there's a, there's a myth making that happens in San Francisco. When you first moved here, people just say to you, isn't San Francisco wonderful? Like you're, you're inculcated into this kind of collective sense. You're never supposed to say, you know, it's actually kind of shitty. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like a lot of you know, crazy people on the street and on the hills. Like, kind of like, you know, so there's a, there's, a, there's a collective myth of perfection that we all buy into and reinforce. And I think it, it can make change even more challenging. Whereas if you live in LA, like, you know, LA, a lot of, nobody thinks LA is this precious little jewel. Mm -hmm. So you have much more freedom to, to experiment. So I think we're just it's very conservative. It's it's like the tyranny of the picturesque. Yeah, exactly. Right? I mean we have a city just through its geography can see itself. Yeah. Right? Like right. you yeah. you're up on the hills, you can see the city. You can see it kind of in yeah. these picturesque right. sort of you know, landscape painting almost uh, kind of preconceived notions of, of beauty and it and it's while it is beautiful, it, it's also incredibly constraining yeah. because yeah. anything that threatens that kind of preconceived, picturesque yeah. image of the city is very tangible um, and, and very difficult to work against. But yet, on the other hand, I mean, in our studio, we, we tried to you know point out that um, you know there are things like the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, Sutro Tower, um, even even the parks are you know there there are these large figures in the city. I mean, even if you take we take for granted that it's okay to have tall buildings downtown, that you can have a skyline. And um, those are these large forms and figures in the city that we, we kind of take for granted and accept mm -hmm. that, that work in harmony with you know, the kind of low rise texture. Um, and no one really you know, now calls those into question. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, well, I mean, there are things like the Transamerica Tower, right, that people have come to love and people really do love. And I think if, if San Francisco just had architecture that was um, well, contextualized as well as um, something that was um, radical and maybe important and in, in a way that, that makes people interested in, in, in developing it as opposed to just looking at it if it's just a tower and just uh, some other tower, right? It's who's going to want that, or you know, people are going to fight against it. But if it's something that is potentially um, incorporating the city, you know, as as a, as a group of individuals, because this city, as any city, I mean, but this city specifically is such a group of individuals. So many people have so many of their own individual beliefs here, um, <laughs> that uh, maybe if we, you know. Incorporated big buildings, big, tall, but um, 
contextualized buildings. Maybe it would change the, the idea of forcing it to be picturesque because we could, could take the picturesque and change what the picturesque is. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll just, you know, I'm, I'm quite new to the city, so maybe this is a naive statement, but uh, I, it took me a while to learn that uh, progressive in San Francisco means uh, being against density. Yeah, they're and literally I just, I, And I thought uh, being progressive would be pro-density, and, and for a while I, I was just, what, what does it mean if you're progressive and against density? And I think um, maybe like, unlike other cities, a lot of uh, density issues in the 70s were written into law. I think a lot of cities didn't have it written into law. That seems very difficult to unwrite <laughs> out, of, out of the law. And um, I think we're kind of dealing with trying to unpack those. And even in the ADU project, working with Mark and Ian, uh, sort of looking at building code issues and planning code issues for the first time in several years and trying to question common sense policy uh, around some of these issues. And we work it slowly. I just got a very important message that there's coffee and cookies uh, just outside for, for us for a little break before we start the next panel in 15 minutes. Thank you.